on this special edition of What's Going On with Shipping Stocks. We welcome back Jay Mintzmeyer, a maritime shipping researcher and the founder of Value Investors Edge. Well, we're joined by Jay Mintzmeyer. It's been a while since Jay has been on the broadcast. It's been too long, in my opinion. We're so happy to have him back. Jay is a huge supporter of the page. I got a chance to see Jay uh, up in beautiful Boston when I was up there for the CBP conference. As a matter of fact, that's where I got my shirt from that Jay uh, gave me right here. So we're, 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 uh, we're here plugging away at it. So Jay, I've been meaning to have you on for a while. I'm glad to have you on before you take off in a new move for yourself. Uh, a lot of topics to talk about. You put this out on Twitter and we have a whole list of uh, ideas here. Everything from tanker buys to the Panama Canal to geopolitical issues to union strikes. Man, there's so much going on with shipping right now. And I thought I'd just turn it over to you first to kind of give a quick little assessment of, of where you think shipping's at right now in terms of the financial market and uh, investment strategies. Yeah, thanks, Sal. Well, first of all, thanks for having me back on. I love the shirt. I didn't know you were going to wear it, so that, that's awesome. Um, good thing I didn't wear my uh, VIE polo today, then it would be, <laughs> it'd be awkwardly matching. But uh, <laughs> I, I'm excited about these topics, um, a lot of areas to get myself in trouble. So I'll, I'll try to stay in my lane. And 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 I know you're probably, you probably know more than me on many of those that you mentioned, like the unions and, and some of that stuff. Um, but as far as your question, the, the big picture shipping markets, um, look, it's been a really volatile year, um, but we've been really pleased at, at Value Investors Edge. We're up 40% year to date in our long only models. And anytime you're up 40%, you know, eight and a half months into the year, uh, that's that's a reason to uh, definitely be happy and, and definitely celebrate a little bit, but obviously don't lose focus. Um, the tanker markets have been very interesting this year. I mean, really, that's been the number one focus in terms of volatility. Um, I, I think a lot of folks jumped on sort of the bandwagon late last year and weren't quite familiar with the volatility, uh, some of the seasonality, a lot of things going on. Uh, 2022 was the all-time highest year for product tanker rates. So I think a lot of folks are looking at year-over-year -year rates and, and things like that. And I think that's added a lot of volatility into the stocks. Um, dry bulk has been by far, and I'm sure we'll get more into this later, but has been by far the most disappointing sector of the year. There's a lot of optimism about China's reopening and, and reigniting that sector, and we just haven't seen it. It's a mediocre or poor year so far. Um, the gas markets, LNG and LPG, um, chugging along. Uh, VLGC propane uh, transport rates are basically at all-time highs, at least when you adjust for seasonality. Uh, to see these $80,000 per day rates in August is, is just phenomenal. Um, LNG, again, massive order book. We've been looking at that for years, but the rates are high. The charter rates are high. We're seeing ships taken for 10, 12-year contracts. Um, very interesting. Um, and then I think lastly, I mean, there's more segments, but these are the big ones. I think lastly, uh, the container ships have held up far stronger than I thought they would. Um, not so much the freight rates, right, what Zem and, and Maersk are getting, but the uh, charter rates for the ships that have held up far longer than I thought they would. And surprisingly, if you look year to date at some of the stocks that performed the best, many of those are container ship stocks. So I think if you would have pulled anybody, including myself, uh, last Christmas, you know, just eight months ago and said, what are going to be the best sectors of the year? I think a lot of people would have said tankers. I think a lot of people might have said dry bulk. I don't think anybody would have said container ships. And yet they've been some of the best stocks uh, year to date. So, that, so that's shipping, right? It's, there's always something volatile. There's always something surprising. And with that, I'm just excited to get into this. Yeah, I you know I'm going to take a kind of reverse in the way you talked talked to these topics because I think number one I remember we were talking about this about a year ago, and we were talking about containers. And one of the things that you talked about that really got my attention is is it wasn't just the the, the container operators; it was companies that were leasing the containers out, and then the lesser companies for the containers themselves. And and one of the things I think you've seen is is a lot of growth in those areas. Those those companies seem to be doing really, really well. And I thought maybe you could comment a little bit on those because, you know, I, I watched, you know, companies like Triton and Textron and a few other ones that that move quite a bit all, all of a sudden. And these were, again, mm -hmm. low players. A lot of people didn't realize what they were doing in that. So I thought maybe give a little context to that and talk a little bit more about those non-owner uh, operators and what they're doing out in the market. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm glad you brought up Triton, uh, which of course had the uh, take private offer. Um, it hasn't concluded yet, but it's going through in the mid 80s. I think about 84.50 is the current valuation of that one. Um, I spent a lot of time last year, Sal, uh, explaining to people what exactly these companies did. 
you know, financing the actual 20 foot and 40 foot boxes. And, and so it's a very, it's, it's really more of a financing play than anything. It's not even really shipping in the traditional sense, but it came into our orbit and, and Tech Stainer Group and Triton, for folks that maybe haven't heard of these companies before, uh, Triton, TRTN, that's going private. So that one's kind of done with, but the other big player is Tech Stainer, TGH. And what they do is they buy the, the 40 foot, 20 foot boxes and they lease them out on long-term seven, eight, nine year contracts to the major liner companies. It's just an alternative form of financing. It's kind of like with aircraft, you know, um, United Airlines and Delta lease a large portion of their, of their fleet. And that's similar to how global shipping works. And so these stocks were just kind of thrown in the garbage bin last summer because people said, well, I, I want to get out of container shipping. It looks overbuilt. The economy is slowing down. Uh, you had these big stocks like Zim that were really popular and, and they kind of took a nosedive. And these container box financing companies were very stable very solid counterparties, no real exposure to any sort of spot market. And they all just kind of fell apart last summer, last fall. And, and so that was a nice little value angle to get into. Um, not much has changed um, their sell in, in year over year. I mean, it's it's kind of just the thesis playing out. Uh, these are solid companies executing well, strong earnings per share, strong free cash flow, repurchase programs, raising their dividends. Um, on the owner side of the actual ships, so think about like Denau's Corp or Costa Marais, it's a similar business model. It's, it's Again, it's almost more financing and operating than it is shipping because they're not actually handling the logistics of you know picking up uh, a cargo in one country and taking it to another. Um, all they're doing is they own the ship and they operate the ship and they lease it out. And those companies also have performed very, very well. In fact, 2023 will probably be a record all-time earnings and free cash flow uh, year for almost every single one of those companies. And so I, I, when I look at it, I say, well... You know, the stocks have done really well, but the results don't surprise me. These are the same results we were talking about a year ago, Sal. I, mean, I, was talking with you. I think it was about a year ago, last time we talked about these stocks. And I said, you know, they're going to earn record amounts of earnings next year. And I think the market was just really skeptical about it. I think everybody was so focused on the freight rates that they sort of missed kind of the bigger picture of how these financing plays actually operate. Yeah, I, I know quite a few people got in it and actually got out a little bit early and then they wound up growing even more. And it's it was a good market. It's, it was an interesting aspect that you don't see. It was a more is a type of element of the shipping market and the containers that happened because of the 2008 fallout when all the container ships uh, companies got out of basically owning their own containers. They went out and and you created these leasing companies and and one of the reasons why you don't see names on the side of containers as much anymore is because that's these are the companies we're talking about right here so it's not Marisk and Hop Hog owning those containers anymore so I, I always think the context there is really interesting and how they play out is is really good uh, let's talk about the dry bulk because that I'm with you on that that was the one that I thought was going okay this is going to hit here a little bit because what we were seeing was a lot of consumption in China. We saw a lot of movement of dry bulk early in the year, but man, it just it just has not. And it just, it has stayed basically pretty, pretty, pretty flat, if not going down in many cases. Yeah, no, in, indeed. And it is by far the most disappointing sector a year to date. I, I think part of that is, well, there's many parts, but I, I think one of the bigger parts in the stocks is that this is a longer term sort of reopening and recovery play. It's, it's not three months or six months. And I think a lot of folks had too much confidence, and I could say myself included in that bucket, had too much confidence on China just being able to flip some sort of lever and, and magically reopen their economy and, and return to those gangbuster growth years. And China is a mature economy. And it wasn't like China was 100% closed to begin with. Yes, they had the zero COVID policies. And yes, some of the leasing was a little draconian and, and things like that. But their factories were still open, and still producing things. So it's not like they went from zero to 100 they went from maybe like 85% capacity to like attempting 95% capacity. So it wasn't, it wasn't all that big of a shift. Um, secondly, that, that the shift in reopening has not been going super well for China. Uh, they have serious issues on, on multiple fronts. I mean, they've always had the demographic sort of overhang that's coming home to roost, but they also have a hyperinflated property sector that, that's been an issue for many, many years. I mean, people have been talking about the, the Chinese property sector warning signs for like 15, 10, 15 years now. So, so this, these aren't new issues, but I think when you're in an environment of higher global interest rates, um, slowing global economic growth, you have these COVID disruptions, uh, it's becoming a lot more difficult for China to just throw a few billion 
or hundreds, even hundreds of billion at the problem and just keep inflating. You can't inflate that property bubble anymore. And if you don't inflate it anymore, then how are you going to get those property developers out there building new apartment complexes and new housing communities? And, and, and that is such a huge driver uh, for Chinese steel uh, consumption. And if you don't have a huge property development sector, yeah, you can build more bridges and, and roads and things like that, but you just cannot uh, replace that lost growth that China has. What do you think about the global impact of things like Russia, Ukraine on the bulk sector, especially when we start talking about grain? We're seeing, uh, you know, climate issues with the shifting India shutting out uh, rice exports. I mean, I, there seems to be this this sector in particular seems to be really dependent and really being fluctuated by a lot of outside sources that are driving it. Yeah, certainly. And, and, and one of the it's sort of a simplistic answer, but any sort of disruptions in shipping are usually, usually bullish for rates because they lead to more volatility. You get, yes, you get some lower rates, but you also get spikes on dislocations. But if that dislocation or disruption turns into a temporary, or excuse me, a, a permanent uh, elimination of the cargo, that's obviously bad, right? So, so at first, the stuff that was happening around the Black Sea in Ukraine, it was mixed to arguably maybe even a little bit bullish because you had a lot of disruptions, but the cargoes were still going out. Well, now with Russia sort of stepping up its rhetoric and, and not honoring a lot of those agreements, or at least um, sort of back, backsliding on, on their uh, agreement for the grain corridor, uh, that is leading to outright destruction of trade. And, and that's obviously negative. Now, I don't have a quantifiable number as to you know the exact percent of trade. It's it's not a huge amount. I would say it's probably 3% or so of the global mid-sized trade, maybe 4%. But when you're in a market like shipping, 2 or 3% demand shifts in either direction can, can have a massive impact on rates. And so I, th I think when you look at mid-size rates, you're going to see a lot more impact from the grain issues. But when you look at cape size rates, which are the largest dry bulk vessels, that's pretty much all China. And so the cape size rates are showing us that the China's reopening is not all that strong, not all that improved year over year. And sort of the mid size weakness is, is all of the above, but I think Ukraine and the Black Sea Corridor definitely plays a factor. Yeah, we're going to come back and I want to talk a little bit about what you foresee coming up in the future, because I think that's going to be an interesting one to look at. Uh, let's go ahead and and head over to tankers because uh, I remember distinctly us having these conversations about tankers. Like tankers are as low as they're ever going to go; they can only go up. There's really no place for them but to go. And in some cases, that's exactly what you saw. And I agree with you on the LNG market. Holy cow! Uh, you know the, the the rates that LNG carriers have been getting. I mean, you all of a sudden you go to a hundred thousand dollars a day for some of these LNG carriers, and then it bottoms out, and then it's back up again. It it is. It is all over the place on on terms of rates, but how does that play out on the stocks and on the market itself, especially when you're looking to tap in? Because again, you're dealing with a, a variety of different tankers here. We're talking about liquefied natural gas. We're talking about crude oil. We're talking about refined. And again, Russia, Ukraine gets thrown into this. We've got OPEC plus uh, cutting production. We've got the U.S. trying to refill back the uh, strategic petroleum reserve. I, I mean, the amount of craziness that goes on that you got to yep. try to figure out exactly how this impacts the market is tough. Absolutely. Uh, lots of little black swan events and, and, and white swan events, as it were. Um, look, I, I think the biggest problem, and I don't want to really say problem, but I, I think the biggest issue or driving factor in the tanker stocks, because that's my that's my lane, right? Is That's my area of expertise in the I imagine a lot of folks will be wanting, you know, they want to know about the rates and they want to know about the underlying factors, but what they really want to know is like, you know, what are the stock valuations? Why are the stocks doing this? Why are they not doing that? And, and I think the biggest issue there is not so much the rates or, you know, what's going on in the world. I think it's people's expectations. I think a lot of folks came in last year and, and keep in mind, 2022 was the all time highest year for product tanker rates. It was higher than 2004, 5, 6, 7, 8 during that entire kind of boom and bust uh, cycle and, and before the GFC. I mean, and, and so 2022 was higher than that. And so that is sort of the expectation that folks had. A lot of people newer to the sector and they said, oh my goodness, these rates are insane. Um, there's this new sanctions regime coming in. Uh, you said kind of jokingly earlier, rates can only go up, you know? <laughs> so um, instead of people saying, wow, this is all time high rates, like, if we could even be flat, that would be amazing. I think folks said, oh, this is just a sign of even greater things to come. And, and so I think the expectations and the bar for a lot of these companies was just set too high uh, for the market. And, and even right now, I've had some back and forth with folks on Twitter, and I love that. 
you have a critique or a question, feel free. Uh, tweet at me anytime. I'll do my best to answer or get into a dialogue or, or whatnot. But I have folks telling me right now, oh, the tanker rates are weak. Well, I mean, we're recording this uh, August 15th. So, you know, don't hold my feet to the fire if you're watching this in a few weeks or a few months. But as of right now, August 15th and the last couple of weeks, these rates are very strong for August. Tanker markets are very seasonal. And quarter three and August in particular, August and the first half of September are typically terrible for tanker rates. It, it is not unusual, even in a decent year, like an average year, it is not unusual to see VLCC, that's a very large crude carrier, it's not unusual to see those rates be zero or negative at this time of year. This is a bad time for tankers in terms of the rates. And so I think a lot of folks are newer to the sector and they're doing two things. One, they're looking at year over year, which 2022 was a complete average. And Q3 was a monsterly strong year, totally unusual, totally driven by the Ukraine disruptions, pre-sanctions trades, uh, inventory restocking, all sorts of crazy things going on. And two, I think folks are looking at the rates in August and they're comparing them to February or March or April of this year. They're saying, oh, the, the trend line is down. Well, yeah, the trend line is down because we're just reverting to normal seasonality. So I would challenge those folks. I'd say, okay, you know, keep watching the rates. Absolutely. Don't, don't stop doing that. But let's, let's look at these rates again in October or November. And if we're in October or November and, and the rates are where they are now or they're lower, then yeah, like the rates are weak and, and there are signs of issues in the market. But I do not expect that to happen. I think when we tune back in in, in October or November, uh, we should expect to see tremendously higher rates in both crude and product, especially crude, though. Yeah, I I remember, oh, man, the height of this, we were seeing VLCCs being used to carry clean product, which is you never, I mean, that's unheard of. And it was going out of the U.S. over to Europe. It, it was it was the craziness that was Russia, Ukraine. It was the it, it was the uh, uh, oil price caps coming in for both diesel and crude. So I think you're right. 2022 is such a tough year to gauge against because of the abnormalities that were in that system going back and forth. There there was so much flux in that system. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the LNG because you talked about it earlier, and I really want to come back to that because I think that's the sector that we're seeing so much growth right now and also the potential for going on. If we look at what's being built right now and the order book that was done, we're seeing those new containers ships rolling off the order book that were placed during the height of the supply chain crisis when the container companies were flush with cash. They're doing it. Uh, we're seeing it a little bit on the tanker side, not as much, but we're seeing a shift there. But LNGs are still the ones that are that are being produced. So I was yeah. wondering if you could talk a little bit about that sector. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and one of the things folks look for, and I look for it as well, it's, it's the number one leading supply indicator, is the size of the order book. And the LNG sector has had a monstrous order book for years and years. And it's only gotten, I, I don't, worse is a loaded word, but yeah, it's only gotten larger. It's only gotten worse. And despite that, even though the order book is, is enormously high, we, we haven't seen an order book like this in LNG um, Really ever, but I think the two closest comps to this order book would be around the 2012, 2013 timeframe. And that was kind of after the Fukushima and, and sort of the advent of more modern propulsion technologies. We had the tri fuel uh, diesel electrics. And uh, the other co comparison would be maybe like 2006, 7, 8 around the China boom. But if you look at nominal levels, that's, that's a percent order book. If you look at nominal levels, we've never had an order book like this. Uh, it is it's quite literally off the charts. And there's a lot of things driving that. First of all, the, the number one thing that's driving it is, is LNG itself is a growth trade. And that was true before Ukraine happened. That was always true. You had major export facilities coming off the U.S. Gulf uh, in planning and final stages. Uh, you had Qatar, which was significantly in increasing their amounts of committed LNG. You had major offshore, uh, or at least proposed projects offshore Africa to develop a stranded gas and export LNG. Uh, places like Mozambique, uh, for instance, uh, major oil companies involved. You had uh, Shell um, and Chevron uh, working on major projects. You had the prelude FLNG uh, off Australia. You, you had some of the major uh, Chevron-backed projects off Australia. So this has been a growth trade for, for many years. And so that's number one. That's underpinning it. This, that's natural. That, that's nothing surprising. And that's sort of a steady base that we can expect to continue. Now, the number two thing, and this is really, I think, what, what, what spurred on the, the growth dynamic last year, is when Russia invaded Ukraine uh, late last January into February of 2022, people realized, whoa, you know, maybe it was the obvious, but they realized, 
we cannot tie Europeans' energy future and our energy policy to this unstable neighbor over here. And we have all these pipelines under development. Russia themselves was developing export facilities for, for maritime. And, and they realized we need to diversify and we need a new source here. And the most readily available source was LNG. Because yes, there's a lead time, but it's 12 months, 24 months, maybe 36 months. Whereas anything else, you, you want to talk about nuclear power or renewables or anything like that, no way could you replace that amount of energy in any sort of 12, 24, 36 month time frame. So LNG got a huge growth spurt. Lots of countries that had been um, kind of negative or cool on natural gas, probably because of political reasons or environmental concerns, uh, suddenly <laughs> their, uh, their concerns changed overnight. Um, suddenly sort of the environmental concerns and some, some of the other political concerns took a back seat. So you saw a lot of companies or countries like Germany, for instance, um, commissioned several uh, LNG import facilities. And it wasn't like these came from nowhere. I mean, these facilities had been proposed for years, but they were held up by you know environmental regulation, uh, different political constituencies. Um, one sort of weird thing is in Germany, they're one of the largest users of coal uh, for power plants. And it, it's kind of ironic because they were seen as like this environmental leader in Europe, but they're actually one of the worst polluters. And so at, like the coal lobby was very anti LNG imports, right? And sort of these little like backroom political nuances. And, and once Russia invaded Ukraine, all that went away. So that's two things. So one is the base, base demand that we talked about, and that's worldwide. And, and that's heavily driven by Asia as well. Um, and in fact, primarily uh, Chinese growth and Indian growth in LNG imports. Number two, the Ukraine uh, shakeup changed everything. And then number three, uh, there's been huge technology changes in the way these engines work these LNG vessels. I talked about back in the late 2000s, early 2010s, we had the tri-fuel diesel electrics, which were a lot more efficient. Well, now we've had an entirely new upgrade about four or five years ago um, called MEGI and XDF. And those are two uh, different technologies, but, but quite similar in the sense that they reduce the boil off of the LNG vessels tremendously. And when LNG vessels are, are or excuse me, when LNG rates are really high, which last year they were, again, near record highs, um, that boil off of uh, I mean, we're getting really technical here, but that boil off becomes more and more expensive. So it used to be, oh, well, this new technology is great. It's going to save us $5,000, $6,000 a day. Well, last year, that boil off reduction was saving up to $25,000 per day in cargo values. And, and when you think 25,000 times 365 times 20 year life of the vessel, you're talking significant, significant savings from these new builds. And so that those are the three factors, Sal, that have really driven this huge order book. And, and anytime I think it's too big and can't get bigger, um, there's another 20, 30 vessels added. So, and, and, and despite that, Sal, despite this huge order book that everybody can see, that everybody knows about, there's companies out there signing 10, 12 year contracts for vessels. And so, so it's just like, it's not like there's a demand mismatch. Like, it's not just like there's a bunch of speculative ship owners out there buying new ships, it's the utility companies, governments. All sorts of other agencies are signing up, energy traders, all sorts of folks are signing up to contract these vessels for long-term uh, 10, 12-year employment. And I think the other thing to put in the context with that is when those ships were heading over to Europe last year for the winter time, it was a very mild winter. We did not have the winters we usually have. You had a lot of tonnage that was being released by China and Japan and South Korea at the time, China particularly released a lot of uh, cargoes that that did that. If China doesn't release that, if there's a competition, a global competition for LNG, I mean, it's, you have the potential there to see those markets really increase. And I think your your point on technology is really important because you were losing a lot of LNG over the time, especially as LNG tankers sat there. And that was one of the big issues was LNG tankers were sitting, waiting to get into facilities while they were being processed and opened up. And so there was a lot of money that was being lost. And, and, you know, you look at LNG export growth out of the United States prior to 2016, this didn't exist. This was a, a marketplace that did not exist. And within the span of less than 10 years now, it, you know, U.S. has become one of the top three out there in exporting and it's continued to grow. I mean, matter of fact, they're, they're pushing for more LNG exports out of the United States. Yeah, it's a beautiful chart. I I don't have it in front of me, but maybe if you're doing some post editing, sure. if you pull up that EIA chart, I know we're thinking about the exact same one, EIA yeah. chart of US natural gas exports. And especially if you can refine it just to LNG, you're absolutely right. It was like nothing um, just a decade ago, and now it's off the charts. So it, it's quite, quite significant. And there's more to come. I mean, we're only, I would say, halfway there in terms of the US uh, potential to export more. 
No, you know, like you said, I, I think especially as as Europe had to basically go cold turkey off Russian energy, they, they were just scrambling to fit anything I think that could provide that didn't turn the power off for them or the lights out. And now as they're getting ready for more of this, and again, we're seeing it globally too. Again, we're seeing developing markets. India will be the potential there for growth in that area. We see how much India gets from the dirty oil from Russia right now out, out of the dark fleet. All that seems to be moving on. All right. So we, we we kind of ran through the sectors a little bit. We talked a little bit on the hot topics that that we had going on there. What is it that you're looking forward to, Jay, in the future? What's the what's the things that you're thinking about right now? And I know we always got to be careful because, you know, your your subscribers are the ones that you 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 develop this for. But what you free feel free to talk about with us is is always appreciated. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, Sal, and it's a great question. Um, the only concern I have, you know, is, is things change. So if you're watching this video, because these these videos have excellent uh, live, you know, tail, and and I don't know if you want to link when you post this later. You want to post the video we did. I think it was about a year ago. Yeah, and, and you can people can watch that one and, and hold me accountable for my for my predictions or or lack thereof. Um, but the one thing I'm watching, I would say more closely than than usual. Cause I don't, I'm not the kind of guy I sound like I, I develop an investment thesis and I don't look at the rates day to day or week to week. I don't obsess about those kind of things. Um, I look for meaningful changes and demand projections and order books and things like that. I look at capital allocation from the companies, but I don't sit there with a microscope and look at daily changes in certain indices. And then some folks on Twitter and stuff do that. And I mean, God bless them. Like if it's working for them, like, you know, keep doing it. Right. But that's never been my style. However, that said, there's two big things I'm looking for. Uh, number one is the tanker seasonality. Are we indeed, and I don't see why we wouldn't be, because when I say seasonal patterns, I mean, I'm literally talking like 19 out of the last 20 years, <laughs> we've seen this pattern. So as so it's, you know, 2022 is the aberration, but aberration, but um, I'm looking at those tanker rates as we head into October. I'm looking for significant strength, especially in crude tanker rates. I expect that to develop by early October maybe middle of October at the latest. And I would expect the product tanker rates to start getting really tight uh, around November, uh, leading up towards Thanksgiving timeframe. And so I will be watching those rate curves and those rate uh, trajectories very closely. And, and so that's the one time I do care about the rates. I, I do want to make sure that I'm not just making things up here about you know what I expect. Um, the second thing I want to see more of, it, it's starting to emerge, but I, I would like to see more, is long-term time charters for tanker vessels. I want to see major trading uh, companies and, and major energy companies, exporters signing up for three, four, five year contracts on VLCCs, on Suez Maxes, on LR2s. We've seen some of that with the new builds. In fact, the new builds are, are mostly not even speculative at this point. Most of the, the dual fuel Aframaxes and LR2s have came with some sort of contract structure attached, but I'd like to see more of that. And, and I'd like to even see companies taking older tonnage on three or four or five year contracts. And, and, and that's been kind of sparse. So far, I think there's a very wide bid ask spread between what the owners expect and demand and want in this market and what some of those energy companies, utilities, energy traders are willing to pay at this point. And so I'd like to see that spread come together a little bit more. And I'd like to see more contracts emerge. So those are the two things, Sal, that I'm looking for in the tanker markets. And I expect we'll see that by October. So again, this is August 15th. Uh, so give it about two months. And I expect to see those things. The other thing, Sal, that I'm watching. And I'm watching it like a hawk, are cape size dry bulk rates, both the spot rates and the FFAs. FFAs are freight forwarding agreements. They're kind of like a futures contract. Think of it kind of like oil futures can kind of show you what people expect the price of oil to be. FFAs are, are what people expect the freight rates for dry bulk will be. I'm watching those cape size spot rates like a hawk because once we see any sort of sustained strength in those rates, I don't think anything's going to slow it down. But it has to happen. It hasn't happened yet. There has not been any sort of sustained level of strength in those rates um, in almost two years. It, things have been weak to moderate. Uh, 2021 was a very strong year. The very start of 22 was okay. But ever since early 2022, the rates in dry bulk have been weak. And I'm looking for any sort of sustained strength in cape size rates. And, and, and you, you might say, Jay, what, what do you mean? Like what sort of number? And so for cape size rates, I would like to see them hold over $20,000 per day for more than 30 days. And ideally, I'd like to see daily prints of 30 to 35,000. If I see those numbers, then we've really turned the corner. And, and then it's time. If you're not long dry bulk at that point, then you need to get long. 
Yeah, and, and I could just say from watching dry bulk rates is, man, they just will not stay anywhere near. Uh, I mean, every week it just seems to be they, they are just the most temperamental rates. I, I watch yeah. it all the time, and it's it, it's amazing to watch because there is no standard in them in some ways and everything. I don't mean no, wrong, I mean, but I, I just, I, I just, I just no. know what you're talking about because it's been so lacking in the bulk market for so long. Yeah, and you, and you didn't interrupt at all. In fact, that was it. I, I don't really like – pull my microscope out and, and focus on these sorts of things that much because we have a, a big picture model. We, we construct our model portfolios. We update those monthly, but the overall projection or, or, or holding period that we strive for uh, is anywhere from six to 24 months. Um, six months would be if we're, we're extremely lucky or correct and things move exactly as we expect, then it might be closer to six months, uh, but honestly more average, probably about 18 month holding period. Um, so that's not a daily or a weekly, you know, day trading, right? I'm not looking at the rates and saying buy today, sell tomorrow, buy today. And again, there's some people on, on Twitter and other places that do that um, and good for them if they're profitable. As I said, they should keep doing that, um, but that's not our approach. But I, I will say those three things I was looking for, just to reiterate for folks, I'm looking for that seasonal uptick in tanker rates by middle of October. I'm looking for more long-term contracts in tanker vessels. And I'm looking very closely at those Baltic Cape size rates for driving. Before we... Uh have you talk about any specific companies you want to talk to i do want to ask you you were up at marine money not too long ago we i didn't get up there myself up, up there and i was wondering your take on it i'll link over to the marine money videos too so everybody can go take a look at them this is a great place to really get some information you want to get wonkiest beyond what we're talking about right here you, you'll get down in the excruciating details there but i was interested in your take is was, was there anything that leaped out at you that that you thought wow this is something that was really you know uh, amazing to listen to and something like okay this triggered something for me to watch going forward yeah, no, thanks for asking, Sal, and, and I hope you come out there next year. I know we were trying to get you to come join us, but uh, hopefully I, next year. I, I, I just need one less job. I just need, I got, <laughs> I, if I can get one less job and just focus on this, I'll be great to go. Hey, well, we got you over to Boston, so at least that, that's half the battle. <laughs> but New York City next June, be there. <laughs> no, I, I posted a public article on, on Seeking Alpha shortly after the conference with, with some of the highlights, and then I posted a, a similar article um, on Value Investors Edge, which talked about the specific companies. Um, and, and we had like 19 different meetings, I believe it was, around marine money with, with specific companies. Uh, I'm not going to name or shame any of those today on, on our podcast. We'll keep it civil. But uh, <laughs> but no, it's always, it's always great. It's always uh, so much better when you can meet the CEOs and CFOs face-to-face -face and have some of those frank discussions. And, you know, nothing's truly ever like off the record. But people are more frank when they're in person or you've had a few beers or many beers, <laughs> many glasses of wine. So, so that was a very, that would be sort of my advice to people if they're into shipping is like, you need to come to this conference. If you're going to come to one conference, come to read money. Um, but I will reiterate a couple high level points. And, and that's one that I made in the article was that last summer, so June of 2022, the tanker sentiment in the room was disquieting. I mean, it was just Everybody was euphoric. Everyone was back slapping. The analyst who's running the panel was like practically screaming. He was so excited. Um, it was almost like unprofessional how excited this analyst was because analysts are supposed to be like methodical, right? And they're supposed to be like disinterested. And he was like, he was practically jumping up and down. Um, and so that was concerning to me last summer. Uh, this summer, I think things were much more moderated. Um, folks were definitely optimistic and bullish and, and definitely selling their companies <laughs> as they should. But there wasn't that same sort of euphoria in the room. Um, so I found that to be pretty encouraging. Uh, in fact, that gave me some more confidence in, in adding to some of my tanker positions over the last month or two, um, not seeing that craziness. So that, that'd be one takeaway. Um, the other sort of interesting takeaway, and, and we've seen it develop so far in these markets, was the optimism um, for offshore stuff like platform supply vessels or like wind farm installation vehicles or like seismic vessel, like all these like specialty offshore equipment things that have been so terrible for so long. And they've been in bear markets since 2011, 2012, right? We, we had the deep water horizon back there that kind of shook everything up. And then we had the big oil crash, what, 13, 14, we had the oil kind of collapse. And ever since then, those markets have been terrible. And I, I would say that there's signs of life <laughs> in the offshore sector, and there's signs of interest. Um, definitely a lot of investors were talking about these stocks. Um, people were, you know, there was a lot more presentations by these companies, like oil rigs and things like that. And, and so that that was my second takeaway, is like, this is sort of the, um, 
I would say the darling of the conference or, or like where all the focus was on was with some of these offshore companies. And, and I, and I think it was, I, I don't think it was like misplaced euphoria. I think it was like very, um, a string of optimism after a decade of downtrodden <laughs> stocks. Uh, so I, I think there's signs of life there. So. No, I, I listen, I noticed someone who invested in Tidewater and you look at where Tidewater was and where they are today. I mean, that was a company that was, you know, this is an oil plat, uh, oil service company. Uh, I mean, they went down, you know, when the, when the offshore oil market went down, they've been down, but man, the new life in them. And, and, you know, you grabbed them a year or two ago and you're doing pretty good right now. Absolutely. So, so what, what, what is Tidewater at right now? I haven't pulled up the uh, chart. I, I hadn't looked at it because I, I didn't get into it. So I just, <laughs> I don't even want to look at it. So let me, I, let me, let me pull up my thing before we were talking here. Uh, Tidewater is $62 today, yeah. Sal. And, and this is, this is sort of funny. I, you know, I'm almost like upset you brought it up because we, no, I'm, used, I'm to cover, it up. we used to cover Tidewater on Value Investor's Edge way back, like, like, six, five, six years ago. Yep. And I owned the stock at point sell from like 10 bucks. I own this thing. Oh, I and know. I would, I would buy it at 10 and sell it at 13 or like <laughs> buy it at 950 and sell it, at, you know, 1295 or something. And, and I just, I didn't feel like our team, myself included, definitely myself, but our entire team, I didn't feel like we had an edge in, in a company like Tidewater. I was like, this thing is in the dumpster. It might recover. It might not. And, and so I think it was like three years ago, Sal, um, we just said, hey, out of all fairness to our members, we're going to focus on the things that we understand and we're really good at. And, and, and Tidewater's not one of them. We're not negative. We're not positive. We're, we're, we have like no official opinion. And now I look at Tidewater and I'm like, oh man, come on, Jay. <laughs> I, I, you know, and and that's an emerging sector because we're talking about offshore wind. And and that is one of those areas that I think uh, I'm not strong enough to talk about in. I, it's one of those areas I, I'm getting better with because I'm doing a lot more research and looking into it. But it's definitely a unique area. It has a lot of of pitfalls too, I would argue, especially in coastal US because of laws and restrictions. Uh, it is comp it's competitive across the globe because everyone's competing to get these platforms up and uh, up and running and the, the there really isn't have been a return i, I don't want to say a return on the investment of the stock i mean on the on the infrastructure you know will this eventually pay off and i think that's where a lot especially in the us right now where there's a lot of pushing for and against wind is is one but tidewater definitely was one of those areas i i, I just noticed is like holy cow this this is a stock that just blew up out of nowhere the one that got away. Yeah, well, there's always one. Yeah, you know that. There's always one. There's always one where you kick yourself. It's like I could have had that for that, and I, I just yeah. that was the one. That that was the, the one. The, the way I justify it, Sal, is even if I did own it, because I, I owned it from like ten or eleven bucks. Even if I had it at ten or eleven, I, I definitely would have sold it at like. Even if I held it for a while, I definitely would have sold it at like twenty five. And right. so I can't. You know, you, you can't. You can't beat yourself up too much. You're yeah. crazy, right? No, because that, that that is one you would sit there and say this is, this can't keep going. It's like it's, it's gonna, there's no way it's going to get higher yeah. than this. All right, Jay, uh, I don't want to keep you as long. I, I, we could talk about this for hours and hours, you and I. I know that, but I really want to kind of get to a wrap point. And one of the things I really love to hear from you is, is what are you looking for in the future? What are some stocks out there that are, are keeping you awake that you're looking at that you'd be comfortable sharing with the viewers? Yeah, certainly, Sal. Well, hopefully they won't keep me too much awake. I, <laughs> I prefer the stocks that I can sleep easy on. Um, and I always am careful when I, you know, I do an event like this where I don't know if it's going to be posted in a week or two weeks or if folks are going to listen in six months. And, and so I'm really careful about that. So we're recording on uh, August 15th here. Market just closed about an hour ago. Um, but some of the stuff I'm looking at right now, I mentioned the big picture things, right? The tanker rates and the seasonality, looking for contracts, uh, the Baltic Cape size rates. Um, I'll just mention, I, I don't see, we'll do like three companies. Um, and I'll start with the sleep easy companies that I feel really good about and we'll end with something a little more spicy. Uh, so hopefully some of these companies haven't uh, reported their Q2 results yet. And I imagine that some of those might have already reported by the time folks watch this video. So feel free to pull up your timestamp and, and hold me accountable. Uh, you can pull up that video too, Sal, if you don't mind later linking that in the bottom or, or maybe even right here, you can link it up there somewhere. And, and folks can see the video from last year too and be like, hey, did, did this guy, was, did he, <laughs> was he credible? <laughs> did all his stocks go straight down into the dumpster? <laughs> what happened? Um, but the sleep easy stock that I feel really good about, and I just added more to it. I actually added more to it yesterday um, because they had a big press release item that the market didn't seem to care about. 
This company is called SFL Corp. A stock symbol SFL. It's really easy to find. It is a huge company with a more than 20 year history. It's backed by John Fredrickson, who is sort of a legend of the tanker markets. Anyone involved in tankers definitely knows who John Fredrickson is. And SFL is sort of got beaten down and avoided because they had a lot of issues with legacy offshore assets, uh, things like that. They had a uh, restructuring and some of their uh, um, support vessels, uh, sea drill, folks probably heard of sea drill, went through like three different bankruptcies. And, and so SFL had some exposure to that. And because of that, they had to cut the dividends. Uh, several years ago, they had to cut back on the dividends. And so that, that company got kind of forgotten about. Well, we just got done talking about Tidewater and, and how much better the offshore markets are. And SFL just yesterday morning, so that would be in August 14th, announced a new contract for their Hercules offshore rig, which we estimate at $520,000 per day, it's gonna add around $100 million in total backlog. And um, that alone is enough to almost double their available free cash flow, just that one contract. Uh, next year when the contract starts. And so when you look at this company, SFL and their dividend, it's 24 cents a quarter, which is not a bad yield whatsoever. It's like 9.6% yield, I think, or 9.4. Um, but just that Hercules contract alone is almost going to double their free cash flow. And so I expect a good portion of that will be shared with shareholders in terms of uh, dividends. They announced a repurchase program last quarter because the stock was unbelievably cheap. And this is a company that has a 20 year history and they have paid out, I think it's three or $4 billion in total dividends over 20 years. So this isn't one of those companies that, that affords their money. They definitely share it with shareholders and they've almost never done a repurchase. In fact, I think this might've been the only time they've done a repurchase and we, we don't know the amounts they've used, but they're going to report results on Thursday, um, August 17th. <laughs> so I guess you can use your Wayback machine with this video and uh, see how I did on this one. But I expect um, they're going to report some usage of that repurchase program. And hopefully, they're either going to raise the dividend or they're going to signal that major raises are coming. And the reason I mention it might be kind of hokey to mention this, even though the video might come out later. But the reason I still mention it is that I think there's a lot of legs on this. One. I think there's a very good potential for 30 to 40% upside with very little risk. So this isn't one of those like companies where you have to zoom in on the rates and watch it week to week or month to month. This is like, if you just check in once a quarter or even once every six months, that should be more than enough with a company like this. And I, I think there's no reason they should trade anywhere below like a 7% dividend yield. You, so you, you think that- You posted this article and I was at my son's school today, first day of school, and I was meeting with teachers. And in between meeting with teachers, I was reading this article and I was like, holy cow. It was it was like, this is something like, like I, okay, where I get this thing? And so I, I was following along with you on it. This is why you got to follow Jay on, on Twitter, because this is what, the kind of information you get right there. Yeah, absolutely. And just to be clear, that wasn't uh, my article that, that I wrote, but it no. was one that... It was one that came out today, and, and I think it came out today. I actually know the guy who wrote it, and I think it came out today because he saw the same thing I saw yesterday, which was this huge uh, contract for the Hercules. And it's funny, yesterday morning, the contract came out, very clear press release explaining what was going to happen. Oh, and we talked about the, the benefit of attending conferences like Marine Money. Well, back in Marine Money, they were very optimistic on a new contract for this rig. Yeah. And of course, it was just, you know, projections, right? It wasn't insider info or nothing like that. It was just, they were optimistic about it. And they said, this is the next thing that the next shoe that could drop is a new contract. And lo and behold, here's the new contract. And, so, and, so it's just one of those and, things. And if John Fredrickson is touching it, it's going to be either great or it's going to blow up. It's one of two things. You know, <laughs> I go back yeah. to Euronav and Frontline. It's just like, it's like, this is going to be either great or, or, or something's going to happen. So yeah, well, this thing's John Fredrickson's baby and it's got a 20 year track record yeah. and it has, it has, been like a tank. I mean, it has survived everything that's ever been thrown at it, and it just gets stronger and stronger. And, and uh, if this, it, any of our viewers want to read a great story, go just Google John Fredrickson. It's great. It's just an amazing guy to, to just. He is the atypical. I mean, he's the typical shipping guy. I think. Out there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very fascinating, and he's definitely one of. Uh, yeah, one of the sagas. You have to know about if you're into tankers whatsoever. You have to learn. You have to know about John Fredrickson. So yeah, that, that's that's one. And, and that's one of the ones where I feel like you never know for sure, right? You watch this video in a year, you might be, Jay, you're an idiot. You know, it didn't go so well. Uh, but this is one of the ones I feel confident about leading front and center with. And I feel that this will stand the test of time. I mean, I feel like if someone watches this video in six months, 12 months, 18 months, um, 
and I'm not guaranteeing it's going to go up. I, I, I can never do that, but I can, I feel very good about the prospect. This isn't one where I have to put a big asterisk, you know, like say some Hail Marys before I go to bed or something, you know, I, I feel good about this one. Um, so I, I think a 7% dividend yield would be probably about right. And I think that dividend has to go higher. Uh, right now it's 24 cents a quarter. Um, so I think, I think at minimum by next year, and I'm not saying it's going to happen Thursday, but by a minimum by next year, I think you could easily get to 30 cents a quarter, maybe even pushing 35 by next fall. But let's just say 30 cents. So 30 cents times four is $1.28 a year. Um, $1.20 divided by 0 0.07. And I didn't prepare this. I didn't do public math. But it's a, it, it's a hell of a lot higher than $10.70. I can tell you that. Uh, so I think seven, maybe 8%, 7 to 8% dividend yield on that higher dividend. Um, I can easily see this thing um, in a year. You, you got to give it time. It's not an overnight thing. But in a year or 18 months, I can easily see this thing at 14, 15 years. And so, and I think that's the sort of, sleep easy kind of stock, right? You're not going to double your money, but it's, it's a solid company. I feel really good putting Mintzmeyer next to that one. Um, let's go medium risk. Um, I've talked about it publicly before, probably won't surprise anybody. I'm very, I'm long the company. I'm talking my book. I like Scorpio tankers here, STNG. Um, they are the largest US listed product tanker company. They are having their own sort of colorful uh, management and lots of press releases and things like that, but they have a huge repurchase program. They have completely refinanced their balance sheet and they have the best assets, LR2s and MR2s with the, the latest uh, eco upgrades and with scrubbers as well, which gives them additional fuel savings. And so Scorpio has been very popular stock. I'm not gonna surprise anybody uh, by mentioning this one. Um, so it trades a little bit over $50 today. Um, our fair value estimate at Value Investor Edge is $70. So pretty decent upside, about uh, almost 40% upside from this point. Um, but we have to watch the rates on that one. We have to see how the market develops. Remember, I said, look for like mid-October uh, crude tanker strength. Look for November Thanksgiving product tanker strength. So give this one a few months, uh, see how it does. But again, it's like 50, 51 today. I believe it's worth 70. That's Scorpio tankers. That's medium risk. And it's medium risk because it depends so much on those spot rates. Those spot rates are volatile. And, and so in three months, the market might be different. Hopefully it's much better, but it might be different. And so that, that's one where you definitely have to pay attention. Uh, I, I, it might not be every day or every week, but you got to pay attention. Yeah, it's been, it's been really a monster. And, and so I had a, a big uh, position on them last year after Ukraine. And, you know, it, like, you know, the first thing you think of is what a horrible incident, how scary this is. But then as an investor and a trader, you start thinking about how will this impact the markets? Yeah. And it's maybe a little crass, but that's, you know, how my mind works as an investor. And, and Scorpio Tankers was top of mind. And so that was one of my largest positions last year. And it was it was quite amazing, but it got a little bit ahead of itself. I think it was like last uh, November, December. Yep. Remember I said the rates peak around Thanksgiving? Yep. <laughs> the, the rates did indeed peak. And, and I think it got up to about 70 bucks. And it, it just it went up to or about 65, I think it was. It got up a little too far too fast. And so right now we're consolidating. And we're consolidating at this beautiful sort of 50, 51 mark. And that lines up really well with the daily moving averages. I'm not a big trader. Normally, I don't even care about DMAs and things like that. But there is a lot of psychology in the market with these daily moving averages. And for Scorpio, that critical level is 50 to 51. And we're right there right now. Yep. So if the rates improve, I think we could see kind of a phase two, phase three of this of this stock. Well, and I think, you know, it's not crass to be able to watch the market and know what's going to happen. I think that's one of the things is because there's positive, there's negatives, there's all these factors that come in. And that's one of the reasons why I enjoy following you and having you on. All right, let's, let's hit over to your last one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so this one definitely needs some asterisks, some disclaimers. I'm long, of course, very long. Um, but this one has some management concerns, some governance issues. I don't know how much money they're going to share with shareholders. Um, so it's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum of SFL. Uh, but this one is Zacos Energy Navigation. ENP is the stock. And it trades in the 21s today as we're recording this. And our fair value estimate at Value Investors Edge is in the upper 20s. But their net asset valuation which is if he took all their ships and all their assets minus all their debts and divided it by the shares, somewhere between 60 and 70 per share, depending on how you account for, for some of the contracts. Because we, we apply a discount to some of their long-term contracts because they're a little below market. So depending on how you adjust that discount factor, 
60 to 70. It trades at 21, but not without reason sell. Uh, the, the, the management has never done anything nefarious, right? Like they've never went actively out there and like screwed over show. They haven't done, they're not one of the, uh, I don't know if I can curse on your, on your podcast, but sure. there's these things called, they're shit codes, right? And, and the, the ones that delude and they're pointless and they're literal scams. Zakwas is not one of those. It, it's very well operationally managed and, and they haven't done anything nefarious, but they haven't really done anything great either. <laughs> they just kind of are there. They just exist, <laughs> you know, and, and, and they have related party management structures where the insiders are motivated to make their fleet larger. Right. It's kind of like a big hedge fund manager. Like his number one goal is not actually to beat the market. It's to like attract more assets, <laughs> you know? And so that's kind of Zakos's thing is like their number one goal is to like modernize and make the fleet bigger. And so if they have these huge years, like they're having right now, they're not going to like make the dividend go up 10 times, you know? And, and so if they, if they earn like $10 in free cash flow, which is actually on the low side and this year, I think their earnings could be almost as large as their stock price on an annualized basis, but don't expect these monster dividends, right? Don't expect $5 per quarter or anything crazy. Um, but I think they will raise their dividend. And I think they're trading so cheap that they might also do a repurchase program. And this is one of those companies where I said, I, I made a tweet about it because um, I don't keep secrets. I mean, my obviously we have our models and those are updated monthly, but I, I don't like play games. You know, I tell people what I own and stuff like that. And so I've been clear that I own this thing. And one of the numbers I've used is $30 by January 1st. So hold me to it. I believe that if, there's always ifs, right? There's always disclaimers. I believe that if the tanker markets indeed firm up like I think they will, and if management doesn't do something completely boneheaded, then I think this, this thing could easily be 30 by January 1st. So there you have it, riskiest to the safest. I said SFL Corp is kind of the sleep well at night, steady income stock. You've got Scorpio tankers, sort of middle risk trader stock. And you have TNP Zacos, which is sort of your riskiest, but has the most upside potential. Well, Jay, we appreciate you sharing that and talking to us for the past 45 minutes or so. I, like I said, I could do this a lot with you. And I think one of the big fears was we would do this way too often. And we'd just be talking about this all the time. And we can just have our own, you know, Jay and Sal channel and just talk about stock all day. I know people would love this and uh, they would enjoy it immensely. But I appreciate you coming on and talking with us. And more importantly, I appreciate your support for the channel. You've been one of my biggest supporters uh, throughout the two years or so I've been running the, the, the show. And uh, I, I, you know, I follow you, subscribe to you. You're one of those people that I think is, is, is a must listen to if you want to follow shipping. So I appreciate everything you've done for me over here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sal. And it's always an honor to be on your show. And I love watching the YouTube subscriber growth. I mean, it has been phenomenal. I wish I, I'm so glad that I've been a big supporter, as you said, but I wish I bought stock in it. That's that was another one that got away, Sal. You know, sell me some. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I will let you know when the IPO happens beforehand. Right. So I, I will I'll let be first you, in line. I, I will let you in on the ground floor. It's it's right. been it's been a crazy ride, but it, it it has definitely been that. Jay, thank you so much for coming on today, talking to us. We caught Jay just before a literal move on, on him. We're, we're catching him. Uh, what you're seeing is is going to go away here in a minute uh, because he Literally is off in like an hour. In like an he, hour, this is all coming down. He's he's he's, he's taking part in a big move so he's moving out of new england and heading to as about far away from the new england as you can get in the united states so jay thank you so much for sh sharing everything with us being with us we look forward to having you back on in the future hopefully it won't be too long but we know uh, it'll be a little bit until we, we can get you back so thanks for being with us absolutely so thanks again